Morning. Good it's morning. good to see everyone here. Give a shout out to our YouTube followers also, since I forget to do that. And uh, glad to see the Urias family here with us today. So. Okay, I've got bi no line bifocal, so I'm, I'm going to see if I can work this and read it to you and uh, not blend these things together possibly. So friendship circle. We'll meet tomorrow night, 7 p.m. in the FEC kitchen to organize and clean. Prime timers will meet at 5.30 this Tuesday in the FEC for some games and sub sandwiches. This, anyone age 60 or over and they would love to have you. Finance committee will meet this Wednesday, 7 p.m. in the FEC meeting room. Heritage Community Worship Service will take place this Thursday at 6 p.m. Anyone is invited to go worship with Pastor Dave and the residents. They love to have visitors. Yes. We have the 24-hour prayer vigil sign-ups are in the back of the sanctuary or it can be found using the attached QR code or on our Facebook page. This is a time at the end of Holy Week in April where we carve out time to reflect on the life, death, and resurrection of Christ and how that applies to our lives. It's also a time to, where we take inventory of our own spiritual lives and what we would like to improve. Ladies Bible Study meets Wednesday evening, 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Methodist Men's Breakfast is held every Wednesday morning, 6.30 to 7.30. Fellowship Hall, invite a friend, join us for good food, fellowship, devotion, and bacon. So, Early Watch Prayer Group meets for fellowship, worship, intercession, Monday through Saturday mornings, 5 a.m. six to 6 a.m. in the chapel, and come and join us when you can. Pastor Dave encourages everyone to enjoy a quiet time with God each day with the daily devotion. And we want to be a church family where we're known, loved, and supported. Pastor Dave is committed to visiting, visiting each family of our church. This can be at your home or in his home or at a restaurant. Please let him know when a good day and time will be to visit with your family. I want to just add a footnote to that. To visit in the home is something that I would ask each family to let me know when and how to do that. In times past, showing up at somebody's home and visiting in the home was a, a custom, if you will. But today, most times, we want to make sure that we're ready for company when we're having them come into the house. So I'm, I'm keen to get to know and support, especially some of our members maybe that are older or maybe going through some struggles. So I do want to encourage you, let me know, not just for yourself, but any of your loved ones, if there's a need... Let me know and I will go and visit and make that arrangement. We have too many members for me to schedule home visits with everybody uninvited. I want to come and I certainly want to meet you here at church or meet you in my home or wherever. But if we're going to become really acquainted and if I'm going to be able to help at those critical moments, I need you to help um, communicate that. And I promise uh, whenever I'm alerted to a need or an opportunity, I will come and uh, support and develop uh, that deeper friendship. So uh, take that seriously. I want to be a pastor who's, in, who's involved in your lives and in your family's lives. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Now if you'll join me in our call to worship. We are, who are humans that you, O oh Lord, are mindful of them? Each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has con conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. 
Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? We are the angels of God, fearfully and wonderfully made by Him. Once we are born again, we become God's work of art, created in Christ Jesus to do good works that God prepared long ago for us to do. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. We love the image of God, fearfully and wonderfully made by him. Once we are born again, we become God's word. Search us, O Lord, and know our hearts. Test us and know our anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in us and lead us in the way everlasting. We are the image of God, fearfully and wonderfully made by Him. Once we are born again, we become God's work of art, created in Christ Jesus. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Spirit, you created us in your image, male and female. You created us. Please forgive our sin, make us new creations, and restore your image in us. It's the second Sunday in Lent. On this Sunday morning, we come here seeking a shift from ordinary to the sacred. I invite you to recall that this is a season of Lent, a time when God calls us in a low, urgent voice. Listen. Jesus is being drawn to Jerusalem. Where is God calling you to go? What is God calling you to do? Let us pray. Loving God, as we journey through this holy season of Lent, may we be open to your presence. Give us strength to make the changes that are needed in our lives and the courage to take on the work of transforming the world. Amen. Let's all stand together and sing All Creatures of Our God and King.
may be seated. So glad to see each of you with us this morning as we have gathered for worship. This is the beginning of spring break. So I know a number of our members are maybe on a trip, a little getaway. We've got some warm weather coming up this next week. That's going to be a blessing. But glad to see each of you with us this morning in worship. Our theme today is who are we? Looking at who are we as mankind or humankind? Who are we as the creation of God? That'll be our theme. And so I ask you to pray with me in unison as we celebrate who God has made us. Beloved Heavenly Father, we thank you for creating us in your image and likeness. Your fingerprints are all over us and your presence surrounds us. You know our thoughts and the number of hairs on our head. Thank you for loving us when we betrayed your trust and sinned against you. Jesus, thank you for dying in our place on the cross. With the prodigal son, we ask your forgiveness and rejoice in the gift of your amazing grace. Please crucify our sinful nature and make us new creations in Christ. Holy Spirit, please fill us and restore your beautiful image and purpose in us. In Christ's name and for his glory alone, amen. If our ushers will come forward, we'll receive tithe, offering and faith promise gifts today. Our stewardship reflection today comes out of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, reading from verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, I'm deeply saddened when I see what's going on in the Ukraine, when I see what people have spent a lifetime building, homes, businesses, families, and right before their eyes it's being destroyed, when I see bodies lying in the street or being carried by medics, when I see bleeding senior citizens and children who are terrified, it reminds me of what we are capable of when we rebel against you and go down a road of our own making. How this creation you created so beautifully has been destroyed, been marred by our sin and our brokenness. And yet, right next to that, I see people who are helping neighbors, who are feeding young men and women who are ready to lay down their lives defending their family, their nation. In the darkness, we see bright shining light as your image is revealed, the love, the healing, the help. And today, as we explore who we are, I pray that we would hear your voice speak to us. As we give to you, we give in response to your love and your goodness in our lives. What an amazing God you are, and we are grateful to be a part of your family. Bless the gift, bless the giver. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
stand and let's sing our doxology together. <clears throat> Praise God. You may be seated. We are pleased to have our chancel choir ready to sing our anthem for us, Lamb of God. If our children will come forward, we'll have a children's moment together. Boy, are we glad to see each one of you. Who's glad that you're on spring break? Some of you. What are we going to do? Maybe some jug fishing. Woohoo! Yeah, buddy. 
going to be sleeping in? My cousins are coming over. Your cousins are or aren't? Are. They are. Good. And, and Jasmine's coming. And, and I'm going to Jasmine's party. Good. You're going to go to a party. I like parties. Anything else exciting happening this week? Yes. Grandma. Grandma's spoil us. Anybody going to be doing a little gardening? Does anybody garden yet? Does anybody dig in the garden with mom or dad? I do. You do. I do too. I'm going to start doing a little gardening, getting ready for the spring. I can't wait to see the flowers and maybe some fresh fruit growing. Mm. I like peaches on the tree or apples. Make my mouth water. Well, today we're going to talk about who are we? And who of you have watched the movie Alice in Wonderland? Anybody? Did you see that movie? Well, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Alice in Wonderland. In the movie Alice in Wonderland, there's a caterpillar. And the caterpillar does what? Smokes. And when Alice comes to the caterpillar, he asks her a question. Who are you? And then he blows a big smoke ring. Listen to what Alice says. The caterpillar asks Alice, who are you? This was not an encouraging opening for a conversation. Alice replied to the question rather shyly, uh, I, I hardly know, sir. Just at present, at least, I know who I was when I got up this morning, but I think I must have changed several times since then. Remember what happened to Alice, what happened to her? She got carried off in a tornado right she was no longer in she was no longer in Kansas she was in Wonderland right anyway that question <laughs> she had to figure out who she was and each of us has to figure that out and I wonder who who you going to ask who knows who you are who knows you best God and which human beings know you best your mom and dad now sometimes you might go to school and you might hear yeah and your grandma your grandma really knows you well and your grandpa too sometimes yeah huh you might go to school and they might say oh you who are you you you're stupid or I I don't like you you can't play with us you don't know what you're doing. And sometimes when people say those things, they hurt us. And we think, is there something wrong with me? Am, 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 am I bad? Am I, am I stupid? You know whose information you've got to believe? You've got to believe your mom and dad's because they know you best and they love you best. And underneath them and around them and above them is a God. And we know what God says about you and me? He says, I love you, and I made you special, one of a kind. There's nobody else like you. Now, every one of us is precious and important to God. We're no more important than a friend or a brother or sister. We're all important, every one of us. I remember a little sign that I saw years ago. It's a little boy. He's got his hands together, and his chin is on his hands, and he's looking out at the world, and this is what he says. I am somebody because God made me and God don't make no junk and I think that boy's got it right sometimes we hear people say things or maybe we're going through a tough time maybe we're not doing well at school maybe we failed a test maybe we didn't do well in our sport and we think man what's going on what's wrong with me you need to remind yourself that God is the one who made you and God says you're very special, you're loved. And your mom and dad, all the days of your life, they've been watching over you, helping you, caring for you. And if you ask them who you are, they're going to say, you're my precious boy, you're my precious girl. I love you, you're special. So when people say things that hurt you or even when you're struggling with something that's going on in your life, Remind yourself of the people who know best 
and that's God, and that's your parents or your grandparents, the people who've been around you all your life. And you know what they say about you? You're okay. You're somebody. You're somebody special because God has made you, and God loves you, and there's not another one like you. Now, there might be some things that we are not the best at. There might be some things that we struggle with, but that does not make us stupid or bad or useless. No, sir. No, ma'am. You are precious and valuable to God. He made you fearfully and wonderfully. And you need to believe what he said. And you need to believe what mom and dad and your grandparents say rather than a friend at school or a comment that's made because somebody doesn't like you and they're trying to put you down. You don't believe that nonsense. You believe what God has said about you. Who are you? I'm somebody because God made me. And God don't make no junk. He got that right. Let's pray. Lord, help us to hear what you say in your word, what you said through Jesus, what you say with your Holy Spirit who lives inside of us, that every one of us is precious, special to you. You have made each one of us valuable, unique. And our moms and dads, our grandparents, our families who know us, and live with us, know us best. And sometimes when we feel down in the dumps or we feel sad or bad because somebody has said something mean to us, help us to remember that what they say does not make it true. What you say makes it true. And what those parents or grandparents know about us, those are the things we can believe. You have made each one of us somebody, somebody special. And I pray that we can live out of that wonderful gift. We pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. There'll be candy waiting for you at the end of the service. We love you. Glad you are with us in worship today. God is happy to see you. Before we share our prayer for illumination together, I want to celebrate a couple of things this morning. Karen Hayes is back with us in worship today. Karen had a fall and she uh, broke her wrist area, and I'm so glad that that is healed and restored and that she's back with us. Uh, I'm glad this morning that uh, Monty is with us. Monty had surgery and they're trying to heal that shoulder and that arm. And we prayed and prayed for him through the surgery and in the recovery. So glad to see him with us. David Harrington has uh, had an eye that's bothering him and they're looking at what to do to treat that. And I'm praying with him daily that whatever is going on there, they'll be able to heal and restore. This morning, we had Twanda Lauer with us in worship after she lost Stuart. For the first time, she was back in worship with us. I celebrate that. I pray for her daily that God will help her with her grief and loss. We had Sue Blem back in worship, first time since Jack passed away. I celebrate for God's comfort and strength that's happening in Sue's life. Bill Landis is back with us. Bill was very, very sick with COVID and pneumonia, and he's feeling a whole lot better and regaining his stamina. I celebrate that. Larry Wiggins is with us, and they've been working on that, on that cheek area and that eye over the months, and each time they're getting him a little healthier, a little stronger, things functioning like they want them to, and I celebrate what God has done in Larry's life every step of the way. Chris Urias is with us today after he had his stroke, and uh, some of the side effects from that were pretty concerning, and God has been faithful to help him regain most of that sight loss and he's going through therapy to be able to read and uh, restore that sight as fully as possible Woohoo! i celebrate that today and little hudson who had surgery on that cleft palate and he's uh, being able to speak a little better and he's healing up nicely i just want to remind each of us god hears our cries god answers god is with us god is helping us and there are dozens and dozens of those examples each and every day. I heard this morning, sadly, in the early service that Carol Stelzer 
and and Larry Salser lost their Kenny Salser lost their mom this morning. She passed away. Carol was in my office in tears, letting me know that his mom was very sick and declining, and she passed peacefully today, early this morning in her sleep. Remember them. Many of our loved ones have passed in the last three months, and God is with our families as they grieve the loss. Our God is present and available and working in our lives, and we are so grateful for who He is and what He is doing. Join me in our prayer for illumination. Living God, help us so to hear Your Holy Word that we may truly understand, that understanding we may believe, and believing we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking Your honor and glory in all that we do through Christ our Lord. Amen. The scripture today comes out of Psalms. We're going to share Psalm 8 together. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praises of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands and put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is the word of the Lord. A couple of questions for you to think about this morning. What was God's original plan for the human race? As you read Scripture, what do you believe God was trying to accomplish when He created us and gave us charge over the earth? Number two, what went wrong? What were the consequences? How did we end up where we are today? And then number three, how did God restore us? What has God done to restore the human race back to His original plan? In order to get us started this morning, I want us to watch a little video that deals with the image of God. We are created, each of us, in the image and likeness of God. Let's watch this little video. It'll get us started. And I guess I could end there and just say amen and we can go home because that Bible project has done a marvelous job of talking about who we are in the created order of God and giving us some images that help us understand that. Three things I want to mention to start with. In the opening story, there's a tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's a test. It's a boundary. It's a limitation. And God says, I don't want you to eat that fruit. I don't want you to go there. I want you to trust me and live within the boundaries I've given you. And those are big, and there's plenty to do. You don't need to cross that line, that boundary. But we know along the way they do, and things go wrong. Because they disobey God. Because they choose to go their own way and not follow God and be a part of His way. The only way to restore that in the New Testament is on another tree. The tree we call the cross of Christ. Christ has got to sacrifice his life on that tree. He's got to hang on that tree and bleed and die in order to pay the price for sin and give us a chance to be restored into who God created us to be. And then at the end of our story, in the beautiful depiction of eternity, of heaven, there's a tree, the tree of life. And the tree of life brings healing and blessing and restoration three trees one 
a test, a boundary, one, a redemption tree, finally, one, a tree of restoration, a tree of abundance that God intends for all of us. The image of God is a very important statement that God makes when He speaks about who we are. In our opening story, in the opening pages of the Bible, God says He created us. And so I must pause there and say there are a lot of theories that we will hear along the way of who we are and how we came to be. But biblically, the revelation of God says we didn't just happen by accident, we were created. There is a creator, a designer, and He is the one who made us. That is a fundamental shift from any other theory about how we started this life of ours. Everybody along the way thinks, just who am I? And what is my life all about? And what am I going to do with my life? What does it mean? When we turn to God's Word, the revelation, what it means is that you were loved and precious from the very beginning. That God intentionally made you and me. We are not an accident. Our lives are not insignificant. We are right there with the little boy who says, I am somebody because God made me. God intended for me to be here. That is huge. For you and I to start from that place that I was deliberately made. I was wonderfully designed. I was chosen by God. And then it goes on to say that God created humans to be his crowning creation the ultimate expression of what he had made and he would say that you and me are his image his likeness in the way he made us male and female we reflect his likeness in who you are and who i am we reflect his likeness now what does that mean well when you got yourself ready today most of you you most probably spent a little time in front of the mirror making sure your hair was just so. If you were a lady, you might have put a little makeup on. Want to make sure your face was looking the best it could. And there in the mirror was a reflection of you, your likeness, your image. It's hard to see yourself without a reflection to help you fully appreciate who you are. And when the Bible says that we are created in God's image and likeness, in some ways, it's like a mirror that who you are and who I am reflects God, helps others to see God, to experience God. So from a little bitty baby to a toddler to a teenager to young adults to older adults to somebody even sick or dying, in all of us there's a reflection of the very image and likeness of God. We can see God. We can understand God because in us, more than anything else God has made, He has revealed Himself. The big question you must ask is, so what does it mean to be in the image of God? Just what does that look like? What are we dealing with? And those who think long and hard about these questions have come up with a couple of ideas, and I want to share those with you. I think they're all significant. The first idea is that when God speaks of being in his image and likeness he's talking about relationships the relationality that we have so right here we've got neil and michelle husband and wife in that married relationship in that covenant there is something about god revealed in the way we are husband and wife together the love we feel the commitment the life we build together that very relationship of being married and raising a family together in some way reveals an aspect of God. That in marriage itself we can see some of who God is and how God operates. In fact, in the New Testament it will speak of Christ being a bridegroom and the church being His bride. And that that relationship in some way between husband and wife helps us understand God's relationship with us. Like a mirror, reflecting your image, your very marriage, your love for one another, the way we commit and work through 
our differences and struggles is a glimpse of who God is. But it doesn't just end there. Husband and wife have children and raise children and care for their family. And the very family, the relationship of family, is a relationship that reveals who God is. God in the essential part of His being is Father, Son, and Spirit, a family, a community, a relationship in their very identity. And so the Scripture will speak of us as the family of God. I will be their God and they will be my people. They will be my sons and daughters. Whoever receives Christ becomes a part of the family of God. In fact, when he teaches us to pray, he says this, when you pray, pray our Father. Parenting is a part of the very nature of God, part of the way God not only views us, but deals with us. In fact, Jesus will say this, if you who are evil know how to do good for your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask Him? How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Part of God's being is revealed in the family relationship. In fact, to be the church is a family, a spiritual family, an eternal family. In the end of our story, God will show up and live among us just like we do one with the other in our families. 24-7, seven, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We are there with each other. But it doesn't just end there. One of the deep relationships we enjoy is friendship. In fact, especially as we grow and we become older, teen years, we start connecting with our friends more and more deeply. And sometimes the relationship maybe with mom and dad is now not as close and as involved as it used to be. In fact, mom and dad might be tearful at times and say, my little boy is now hanging out with his friends a whole lot more than he's hanging out with me. Mom and dad have become sliced cheese, not nearly as important, not nearly as involved as they were when they were little boys and little girls. Now all of a sudden it's all about the friends. They want to hang out with their friends. They're going and dragging Main Street. They're going and kicking the soccer ball or shooting hoops. And so it should be. Not a bad thing. There's something about friendship that is deep and abiding. In fact, Jesus says this, I don't call you servants any longer. I call you friends. Friendship in itself, that relationship where you get to choose who your friends are, where you build that deep and abiding friendship is something that speaks of the very nature of God. He has chosen you and me. We did not choose Him. He has gone out of His way to get to know you and me. He likes to hang out with you and me. Prayer is not a responsibility. It is an opportunity for friendship with God. Worship is not just a duty. It's the wonderful celebration of a relationship with God. Yes, in your friendships, in my friendships, there is a reflection of who God is and the relationship God longs to have with each one of us. So those who think long and hard about the image of God will say, relationships, our relationality, the way God has made us, is what that image of God is all about. Then others will say, no, no, I think it's more than that. The way God has made us moral beings, people who know right from wrong, people who want to figure out what the best way to live is, is part of that image of God. That very inbuilt understanding and desire to live the right way, to make good choices, to be a moral being, not just an instinctive being. You and I just don't do what comes naturally. We think about things. We work them out. We make choices. That will and that ability for you to be moral is what God's image is. So that reveals a part of who God is, that God has that ability to discuss and to decide what is right and wrong. And we know that God chooses right and does not choose wrong. But He has given us the ability to choose 
right and wrong, and often we choose wrong. In our call to worship, there was that wonderful progression out of James, that each of us has evil desires, and if we give in to them, we make bad choices, and those bad choices lead to sin, and when sin grows up in you and me, you know what it does? It kills. Sin kills. And that's a part of a moral gifting that God has given us, the ability to stay close to God and be righteous or to make bad choices and get caught up in sin and what sin births finally is death. So those who think long and hard about the image of God will say our moral makeup, our ability to make those decisions and live them out reminds us of who God is and how God has made us. Then there are others who say, yeah, I think it's more than that. I think your very ability to think, to build knowledge, to be self-aware is part of what it means to bear the image of God. That most animals, birds, fish, they're not self-aware. They don't have that ability to be almost conscious of yourself and what's going on in your life. And your ability to think and reason and learn and have knowledge, that is a reflection of the very image of God that he has borne you and me to carry, like a mirror reflecting a part of his nature, his being. And then others will say, it's even bigger than that. Your very being, who you are, the whole complex wonder of who you are as a human being, all of it is the reflection of God, the image of God. All those pieces, the ability of you to relate to others, the ability of you to be a moral being that makes choices, good or evil, your self-awareness, your ability to learn and grow, and more than that, your very life, the very being you are, reflects God in some way You and I in our being are an image of God. Now the sad news is that when we sinned, what God had created got damaged. And it breaks down and there's less and less being reflected in the way God intended. In fact, the image of God has become not only reduced, but in some ways maligned, kind of ugly, an ugly image, a scary image. And you only have to look at what's going on in the Ukraine with all that destruction, with all the death, with all that's happening that maybe comes from misuse of power and greed, and all of a sudden the image of God is not a very, a very recognizable thing. There's something really ugly and disastrous happening there. But you know what's interesting? Right in the midst of all of that, you're seeing people rushing in and putting out the fires. You're seeing people rushing in and getting the wounded out and carrying them to safety. You're seeing parents who will do anything possible to save their children or to help a neighbor. And we are seeing a glimpse of the beauty and the wonder of who God made us in that war-torn disaster. And so biblically, especially as we read Psalm 8, all of a sudden the psalmist asks, who are we that you are even mindful of us? Why are we so important to you? And the psalmist answers and he says, because you created us. We're just a little lower than the angels. All the wonder of this created order is a part of who you made us to be and enjoy. You gave us the responsibility of looking after this wonderful world of ours. We are the gardeners. We are the caretakers. We are the the stewards of what God made. So we could enjoy it and we could grow it and we could share it with each other. Unfortunately, when sin destroyed that, all of a sudden we were lost and deeply broken, fractured. And God was committed to restore who we are. And that's why he sent us his son who would become the true image of who we were created to be. If we see Jesus and study his life, we will see what the image of God should have looked like in each of us. He becomes our example. He becomes our pattern. But he's more than that. The scripture says he came 
not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. And what ransom means is to buy back what was lost. So when Jesus goes to the cross and he hangs there, he's now restoring the possibility of what you and I can be as human beings. Where we have been broken and lost and enslaved, we now can be free and made whole. And so the gift of new life restores the image of God in us. That's why Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, he has predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. God wants that beautiful first creation to be restored in you and me. And this is how it happens. As you and I believe his son, as you and I receive his son, as we allow the blood of Jesus to wash away our sins and the spirit of God to fill us, we become new creations. The image of God restored in us. And all of a sudden we can start growing back into those beautiful people that God intended us to be right from the beginning of Genesis. God was not going to leave us lost and enslaved and broken. He came and rescued us through sending us His Son. And now, the answer to the question, who are we? We are the creation of God. We are those who have been made in His image. And through Christ, we can be restored into the beautiful image of God. In fact, Paul writes and he says, he wants to raise each one of us up into the fullness of the stature of Christ so that when people see you and me, they don't just see who we used to be, but they see Christ in us. They see the very character and the nature of God growing in us. Now, here's the sad news. Without God's help, it can never happen. Without God's forgiveness, it can never happen. Without you and me inviting God into our lives and being filled by His Spirit, you can never reflect His true image and glory. But if you welcome Him, if you are filled with His wonderful Spirit, then God in a beautiful way restores you. That's why Paul says this, if anybody be in Christ, there is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have been made new. Yes, that beautiful picture of the end of our story, when we all gather in God's family, when the tree of life is producing fruit, a different fruit every month to heal us and restore us, it's a glimpse of what God intended for us to be and enjoy. God wants you to have life, an abundant life. God wants you to reflect who He is. He makes you and me a mirror to help others see who He is, His relationality, His morality, His cognitive ability, His ability to learn and grow and share, His ability to love and to bless the very beings we are, each one of us a precious soul. No wonder Jesus says it this way. What would it benefit us if we gained the whole world? and we lost our soul. What could we give in exchange for our soul? You see, our soul is precious to God, each and every one of us. Every one of us fearfully and wonderfully made by Him. None of us more important than the other, but none of us unimportant. None of us a waste, a failure. None of us stupid. Every one of us precious and valuable to God. That's why Jesus died on that cross. That's why He said, I love you this much. And I'm not going to be finished until I help you find your way back, until I restore in you the beautiful image of God you were created to bear. So your marriage reflects Him, and your family reflects Him, and your ability to learn and grow reflects Him, and your ability to make good choices and carry out what is right, to be righteous, reflects Him. But it's more than that. The very being you are, is a reflection of the God who made you. One of our early church fathers said this, a human being fully alive is the glory of God. You reflect His glory and His goodness when you truly come alive in Him, when His Spirit is growing you and filling you and using you, when your life 
is filled with the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, all of these qualities, a reminder of the God who made us. So when they see you, they can say, I don't just see you, I see the Jesus in you. Christ in us, the hope of glory, our pattern, our redeemer, the very gift of new life so that we can be restored into God's image. Let us pray. Lord, what a privilege it is to be called to belong to you. More than anything else, you want us to know you and you want us to know who you are and how much you love us. You want us to be in that close family relationship where we can call you Papa, Daddy, Abba, and when you can call us son, daughter, beloved. You want us to grow in all the abilities you've given us. The ability to follow you and do what is right. The ability to think and learn and have knowledge. To appreciate the wonder of this world. Where we can say, Lord my God, how majestic is your name in all this earth. And Lord, you want us to come alive, spiritually alive not to be dead in our trespasses and sins, to be a soul saved and enjoying the abundant life that only you can give. I pray that each of us would realize each and every day as we look in the mirror that you have created us to reflect your image and your likeness in a variety of ways. Come and live in us. Come and reveal yourself through us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll remain seated as we sing the church's one foundation. The application today, 
God created you to bear His image in your maleness and your femaleness. Even in your brokenness, there are dull reflections of who He is. And as we allow Christ's entrance into our lives, as we become born again and spirit-filled, God restores His image in us. No wonder He said this, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. That love becomes possible as He pours that love into our lives, as He makes us new creations, those who now have the ability to reflect Him in who they are, in the decisions they make, in the very character that they are possessing. I pray that you and I will welcome Christ in our lives and become a part of His wonderful image here on earth. We're going to sing together, He has made me glad, as we prepare for intercessory prayer. And after intercessory prayer, we're going to welcome a new covenant member this morning, Crystal Garrison. Let's sing together, He has made me glad. Anyone who wants to come forward and kneel here at the chancel rail, please do so as we pray together. The rest feel free to pray right there in your pew. It matters not where we are and what our posture is. They're all wonderfully received and are an expression of a relationship with God. Lord, I bend my knee and bow my heart and each of us, acknowledges you and prays to you. We say with confidence that you are the living God and we want to be your people. We want to be your family. Be our heavenly father. Lord Jesus, be our savior. Holy Spirit, be our best friend and personal trainer. Make of us the beautiful image of God you created us to bear. Lord, I want to thank you for all the comfort all the healing, all the help, all the blessing, all the provision that you have poured on our lives. As we look back, all of us together say thank you. You are faithful. You are generous. You are merciful. And we, your people, say thank you today. I want to pray for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones, especially the Stelzer family, as they lost their beloved mother and grandmother. Be with all of those who are grieving today, yesterday we had funerals for three families. We pray that you'll be with the Hintergaard family as they grieve the loss of Mary. We pray for the Masoni family as they grieve the loss of Mark. We pray for the Brockman family as they grieve the loss of Sharon. Many, many of our family members have lost husbands, wives, mothers, fathers, siblings. We pray for all of them, Lord, be a husband to the widow, a father to the fatherless. Be the God of all comfort to those who are grieving today. We pray for those who are going through surgeries. Paul Brisboy will go through surgery on Wednesday. We know Emma Eldridge is recovering from her knee replacement, as is Bonseal Hale. Lord, we pray that you will heal each of them. We pray for Linda Hitch, who had her foot broken and reset 
help her recover from that surgery. Thank you for taking care of little Hudson. Continue to heal her and help her. Many who need your touch. Thank you that Chris is here recovering. We're celebrating what has happened in his life. We pray for those who are dealing with addictions, those who are going through the pain of divorce, those who are preparing for marriage covenant. We pray for those who've got financial difficulties, for families that are experiencing hardship, whether it's a strained marriage or children who are in the far off country living a life that is causing heartache. We pray, O oh God, that you would help in each of those circumstances. I pray especially today for the Ukraine. I pray for those citizens who are under attack, who are living with the terror of bombs and rockets and tanks coming in and destroying their homes, their families, their lives. Help the Ukrainians, Lord. I pray against all the evil plans that are being made against them. Be with all of those who are coming to their aid. Have mercy on us. We're a crazy human race without you. We are capable of great hatred, destruction, evil. We cry out for your help and forgiveness. And Lord, we pray especially for our beloved Victory Memorial United Methodist Church. Make us a bright, shining Christ light. May we reveal your image. May your goodness flow in our lives and through our lives. As we join together and pray the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I have a beautiful YouTube song that I'd like you to listen to and maybe, oh no, the covenant membership. Thank you, Ashley. Come on. I almost forgot. Woo. Crystal, come forward. With your family. Crystal has decided to become a part of our covenant family. Anybody is welcome to worship with us. And anybody is loved and accepted here as part of the family. But to make a part of the covenant formal and to say it out loud and to be received is special. And we are so glad that Crystal wants to do that. We welcome her. We love her family. And so I'm going to ask her the historic question. Crystal, will you be faithful in your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness as you live under the Lordship of Christ? Yes. And church, I'm going to ask you. Will you be faithful in your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness as you live under the Lordship of Christ and welcome Crystal and help her become the disciple that Jesus wants her to be? Let's pray together. Lord, we are so glad to welcome Crystal as a part of our covenant family. We want to love her and support her, her and her family. We want them to grow into the beautiful image of God that you created them to bear. Bless us and make us all together a blessing for Gaiman and beyond. We pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Crystal will be at the back of the church when we close so you can welcome her and hug her neck. God bless you, Jared. Bless you. Glad to have each of you with us this morning. And Crystal, there's your card. Your membership card. Oh, thank you so much. Now, YouTube video. What a beautiful name. I pray that you will sing along and realize what an incredible gift God has given us in sending Jesus to restore us back into the family and image of God. And with me, receive God's blessing and God's challenge. I pray that you and I will become image bearers more and more clearly seen in each day. Hebrews 13, verse 20. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, 
through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.